last day of our one week uh, spiritual reflection on the impact and implications of the pandemic that is engulfed the whole world. For those of you who are joining us throughout this week, we've been reflecting on the theme in these times, understanding the meaning of now. And I want to thank the young people uh, from the Northern England uh, who have pulled this together. Uh, it started out as an attempt to just meet every day of the week to pray. And you requested that I join you and offer some reflections on some of the challenges you are facing. Prior to my coming, I had asked you to send me some questions that you may have. And the questions you raise became the basis of the contours around which I developed these series of Bible reflections. The theme in these times refer to our time. In case you are not fully aware of it yet, the world as we know it has changed forever as a result of the pandemic. There is an author called Harun Rashid, comes from Jammu and Kashmir in India. He has captured the change that has taken place in our world today with a powerful poem that has gone viral. In fact, it has been translated into so many languages, Chinese, Italian, Spanish, Arabic, Indonesian. That short poem captures this change. Let me call your attention to that poem. It says, we fell asleep in one world and we woke up in another. Suddenly, Disney is out of magic. Paris is no longer romantic. New York doesn't stand up anymore. The Chinese wall is no longer a fortress and Mecca is empty. Hugs and kisses suddenly become weapons and not visiting parents and friends becomes an act of love. Suddenly, you realize that power, beauty, and money are worthless and can't get you the oxygen you are fighting for. The world continues its life and is beautiful. It only puts humans in cages. And I think it is sending us a message. And the message is, you are not necessary. The air, earth, water, and sky without you are fine. When you come back, remember that you are my guests, not my masters." Unquote. Yes, the coronavirus is sending us a message. We are not the masters. Somebody is in charge. The present pandemic has changed the world forever as we know it. In fact, at the time I, uh, I came on, 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 on the air, I discovered that at the moment, 2.8 million people worldwide have already contracted this virus. 195,000 people have died worldwide. In, in, in the US alone, 905, 
1,000 cases have been registered and more than 50,000 people have died just as I'm speaking to you now. And this would keep climbing. This is quite amazing considering the fact that in January, most of us had never heard about this virus called COVID-19. We had never seen anything like this. It is unprecedented. We thought we were starting 2020 in good string, but suddenly the whole world has come to a halt. Billions are sheltering down, locked down against an enemy they cannot see. We are all wearing masks, gloves, and we go out because we don't know when or where the virus will strike. And so we are all hunkered in. We can only go out for essentials. The present pandemic has changed the world as we know it. But what about the future? Has it changed? our outlook on the future. How does COVID-19 challenge us to understand Bible prophecy? And how should we live our lives in the light of the end game events? This is going to be the subject of our reflection today. What does this teach us about the end time? Theological, we call it eschatology. We've talked about how it changes our views about God, about humanity, about sin, about even uh, death, how it has changed our mind on a number of issues. What about end time events? Before addressing this question, and especially how we should live in light of this uh, crisis, I'll take some time to answer your questions. Uh, today, I'll take a little more time because your questions uh, were many. Uh, I ask you throughout the week to be sending your messages and the questions you may have, and I would attempt to answer them. So allow me to do so right now. Some of your questions are general in nature. Some are specific to the discussions we have been having. And some of them would be addressed or need to be addressed at a future time because we cannot uh, have time for all of these right now. I'll be very brief and then transition to our devotional reflection. The, the first question uh, that came to my attention is, what does the Bible teach about pestilences, plagues, and global pandemics? Will God punish the sinner by using human interventions? What the Bible teaches about pestilences, plagues, and global pandemics uh, is huge. I, I can just summarize for you. Scholars have uh, uh, found out that approximately 120 times the Bible uses the words pestilence and plague. Starting from the time Moses called down the 10 plagues in the book of Exodus, and ending with various plagues, the seven last plagues in the book of Revelation. In between, there are many striking examples of God using pestilence as part of divine judgment. In Numbers chapter 16, 41 to 50, 14,000 people died because of a plague. In Numbers chapter 25, uh, from one onwards, 24,000 people died because of a plague. In 2 Samuel 24, and verse 15, 70,000 died because of pestilence and plague. If you really want a full picture of what the Bible teaches, I will recommend highly to you an online article by scholar Joel Rosenberg. The title is, What Does the Bible Teach About Pestilence, Plagues, and Global Pandemics? And he will show convincingly that God sometimes sends pestilences as judgment. Another question that was asked is this, is COVID-19 one sign of Bible prophecy? Is it a, a, a sign that this is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Well, 
uh, the Bible says natural disasters would be part of the signs of the end of time, increasing frequency and intensity of natural disasters. In Matthew 24, verse 7, the Bible mentions famines and earthquakes in many places. But in Luke chapter 21 and verse 11, he offers, the Bible offers one additional information. It says there will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places and fearful sights and great signs from heaven. So in addition to pestilences, we, we now have, when we say pestilences, we are talking about infectious diseases of every sort, from leprosy, smallpox, botulism, plague, and in our time, Ebola, signs, uh, SARS rather, and coronavirus. A pestilence is any deadly disease that has impacted a whole community. And we use the term pandemic to describe the epidemic that has spread literally around the world. Your question is, is coronavirus, uh, corona, coronavirus a sign of the end time that we are living in the last days? The answer is yes but it should not be taken in isolation from other signs. God has given us many signs, tornadoes, earthquakes, fire, mass light, bombs, missiles. They are all part of the signs and coronavirus as part of pestilence is one of the signs. But if your question is, is this virus specifically prophesied in the Bible? Then the answer is no. God does not mention the name uh, coronavirus or the disease COVID-19. If we are using this to terrorize people into thinking because of this pandemic, Jesus is coming next week, next month, next year, we must be a little careful because Christ himself told us in Matthew 24, 36, that of that day and hour, no one knows. So yes, coronavirus fits into the general scheme of signs of the times pointing to Christ's return. If we are looking, however, for a specific sign that will convince us that Jesus is coming, then we need to point to another sign, and that sign is global or worldwide evangelism. In Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a testimony, and then the end will come. The sign we should look for that is, you know, a uh, uh, solid, sure that Jesus is coming is the preaching of the gospel in the whole world. To the extent that this virus has opened up the airwaves, the technology has opened up the airwaves so that people literally everywhere can now listen to the gospel, we can say it is an important sign. Okay, another question. With the dangers of COVID-19, how can I as a Christian contribute or engage my neighborhood and community? I think this is a valid, valid question. I had initially wanted to talk about Christian social responsibility in the light of this current pandemic, but there wasn't time to engage it. Needless to say, we should be challenged as Christians to engage in society and community. Typically, our only response to crises and disasters tend to be, let us pray. So we have revival meetings all the time, let's pray, as if this is our only responsibility, or in some cases, let's do evangelism. 
So we are engaged in Bible prophecy and all of this. That seemed to be, in my opinion, uh, the, the, the most, uh, uh, that, that seemed to be the way we tend to respond or engage the world. But friends, Christians have an obligation to engage the world in a compassionate, caring manner. Unfortunately, many of us are afraid to take responsibilities for our communities and also our neighborhood because we are afraid. Christian social responsibility requires that we explore means of engaging in humanitarian activities, social service, as well as social action. Not only should we relieve human need, we must also remove some of the causes of the human need. We must be engaged in philanthropical causes, but at the same time, some of us need to be engaged in the socio, political, and economic activities that impact a larger body of people. We should not only reach individuals and families, sometimes our work should transform the structures and systems that have caused problems. We must engage in works of mercy as well as in works of justice. What this means is to engage the world, some of us need to rethink our career options. For far too long, we tend to think the only thing we can do is I'm going to study medicine, I'm going to do engineering and accounting. That is what our parents are urging us to do. But some of us need to seriously consider that perhaps now is the time to change your vocation and become a teacher and become a social worker to make a change in society. Some of us need to consider advocacy human rights courses, journalism, graphic design, technology. And to do this, we've got to excel. Excellence is key. Go into law, be a research scientist, ministry online. Perhaps this event you have started online, you just on your own group yourself together as a group of young people, let's think, let's pray. Perhaps this can be the beginning of a parachurch organization or ministry of young people, of students your age, linking you not only to your friends on other parts of Europe, but to Africa so that you can effect changes in the world. So the COVID-19 should challenge us as young people to consider different ways we can engage the world. Another question that came is, how will COVID-19 impact the church? I would answer by saying it has already impacted the church. And it will continue to do so whether we like it or not, positively and negatively. You see, sometimes our churches tend to be a very slow to change. We are not willing to change, but this crisis is forcing us to change. Christians tend to be afraid of the use of technology. And so when TV and radio came, we were afraid to, to, to use it. When internet came, we were afraid to, 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 to use it. But somehow, now that churches have been closed down, at least temporarily for now, suddenly every church is learning how to use Zoom. Even you, young people, I could sell from the glitches we are facing that you need to be adept in how you use this technology. The church as a structure, our church and other churches are changing. I know uh, our church recently, every year before GC session, the church leaders from around the world, about 300 plus gather and then have meetings. And it costs thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. With this virus, suddenly they had to cancel it and conduct the same meeting via Zoom which saved us hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
the church is changing. And not all the changes will be positive. Financially, the church is changing. If we cannot go to church suddenly uh, in a body, now tithe is now online. You give your tithe and offering online and no one will be there to scream at you, return your tithe. So finances are beginning to go down in some places. Thank God in other places, finances are rising. But in areas where finances giving is reducing, it means it is going to affect the issue of retention of pastors. What does it mean? Many pastors will be laid, down, la laid off. So ministry as we know it, it's not going to be the same anymore. The church also is becoming democratized. Zoom, attending church via Zoom means People are not locked in into a particular church. In fact, young people and many others are now doing what you call Zoom church shopping. If you happen to be in a particular church and your pastor or elder is a lousy pastor or elder who cannot teach the word, you are stuck. But now with Zoom, people are literally going all over on Sabbath mornings. You are wondering, which church should I attend? Should I? You can go anywhere. The church is now without walls. And rightly or wrongly, church members have options now. And by the way, that means we also have opportunity to visit other churches. Sometimes we are locked into our own denomination, so we have no clue what others are doing. And in many cases, we speak ignorantly about other churches. And some of us are also fascinated about other churches, mindless fascination. But now because of technology, literally every church has their menu online. And so you can find out what is going on. And in areas where church politics is literally stifling the church, they would not invite some speakers for political reason. Now with Zoom, you can speak to everyone everywhere. No longer this power strain. What I'm saying is, COVID-19 has impacted the church positively and negatively, and it will continue to do so. Our responsibility is to find out how do we employ this current situation, especially technology, to impact the church for good. And by the way, because now we've been locked in, perhaps it is forcing us to go back to the early church where they met in small groups, in homes, in the family, instead of these big mega churches where everyone has a show. I thank the Lord for COVID-19 because it is forcing the church to change the way we do things. Yes, Hebrews 10, 25 says, we shouldn't forsake assembling of ourselves together especially as we see the coming of Christ is coming near. And so, yes, we need to find ways to meet, not just spatially through uh, technology, but find ways to meet in smaller groups. And so I, I, I'm saying so much, don't, don't get me going. Will COVID-19 impact the church? It has already impacted the church and it will continue to do so. Another question, I have to be very brief because uh, I'm looking at my time. Another question, someone says, I don't know whether it was a statement or a question, the lockdown is stressing me out. Being at home with my parents and siblings 24 seven is very stressful. I want to be at school. Okay, I hear you. But perhaps I should tell you, you are not the only person stressed out with the lockdown. Your parents are also stressed out. When you are home, you overeat. You have no idea how much it costs parents to get food. When you are in school, at least 
you don't eat as much. Now that you are home, you eat like grasshoppers. And your parents don't have the money. And it is stressing them too. You don't clean your rooms. You are always on the computer and the phone. It is stressing them out. You are not the only thing. Lockdown is for one purpose, in my opinion, God is using it to force us to develop character. Learn to live with others. Overcome your weakness and your character flaws. It is part of God's plan for your growth and sanctification. So you are not the only one stressed out 24 seven. Your parents, if they are honest, they will tell you, especially, you know, your parents who live abroad, when they were working every morning, father goes, mother goes at different times, you know, sometimes they don't even meet. Now they are all locked in, very frustrating, annoying and fighting. But God has allowed it to help us to learn, to think, to grow, to overcome our weaknesses. Okay, another question. Based on day three of your presentation, was Jesus not pleading for those who died? Day three, we talked about Jesus, you know, saying, you know, the tower fell, killing 18. Pilate killed some folks in, in, in Galilee. And Jesus says, unless you repent, you'd likewise perish. And we concluded that day by saying the reason we have not died is not because we are more innocent than those who died through natural and accidental disasters, man-made or natural disasters. It is because Jesus is pleading for us. And your question is, was Jesus not pleading for those who die? Yes. He was pleading for them until the approbation closed. When they died, their probation had closed. And at that time, if their lives were hidden in Christ, there will be a resurrection for them. If not, then they will face God's eternal damnation. The fact that we have been spared means God has given us another time, another year to change. He is pleading for us so we can repent. Okay, another question. Is it wrong to seek help from psychics who have promised to help us overcome our stress? Is seeking help from someone who can foresee the future wrong? Well, this is a question I haven't covered it. Perhaps uh, if you plan this well some other time, I can give you a series on uh, spiritualism, occultism, etc. For now, I will simply say this. Satan is at work. In fact, it is one of the signs of the last days. Let us not confuse occultism or spiritualism with spirituality. Spiritualism, anything that ends with Ism generally tend to be bad. Spiritualism deals with using Satan's power to deceive. Spirituality, on the other hand, is using the power of the Holy Spirit for good. And the Bible teaches us there are good and evil angels who are doing all kinds of things. We cannot go to seek help from Satan. I, I, I would defer this question. Perhaps another time we can do another series on this subject, including signs and wonders, miracles, and all of those things. Let me go to the next question. On day two, we read Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14, that God cares. He knows our frame. But why are some of our church leaders and pastors so heartless? It appears that they don't care about our salvation, but they focus on the mistakes people do make in the church and they make church so unhappy. How come church is so judgmental in my dress, my music, et cetera, et cetera? They only focus on my mistakes. I don't know how to answer this. Perhaps it is out of care 
that they point out some mistakes. If you dress like a, a, a somebody going to milk cow shabbily, your parents have to speak. And that is not being judgmental. If you are listening to some crazy music, if you are lazy, you keep your room like a pig pen, they have to complain. That is not being judgmental. If you go to church and you are lazy and careless and like you have gone to a, a, a this, whatever, somebody must point it out. That doesn't mean they don't care. So that's my first point. But I understand the, the, the burden of your question. Yes, it is true. Sometimes, you know, church members and leaders can be heartless. And it is because they are not God. They are human. They make mistakes like you. And so what we need to do is to re-anchor, re-center our life on the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone would never fail us. And if there are some church leaders and pastors listening, listen to what this young person is saying. We have made the church, and sometimes our home looks so cruel. Okay, I leave that. Okay, another question. In the Bible, it says, before God created us into our parents' womb, he already knew us. If he knows, why is he going to judge us when he comes? Very simple, he's going to judge us according to our works, how we use the freedom of choice he gave us. See, when God formed you, he had a plan for you. In your mother's womb, he had a plan for your life. Unfortunately, some of us take these plans and blow it. And so he is coming and he's coming to judge us. And his judgment will reveal to the whole world that if you are going to be lost, it is because you chose to be lost. Another question, how is God saving and keeping the homeless people during the pandemic? God is keeping homeless people and the poor people through human beings. God would not send angels to parachute and distribute food and help the poor. God wants to help the needy through you. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 25, in the last days, people will come before him, the sheep and the goats, and he'll tell the sheep, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. I was in prison, you visited me. And the people said, Lord, when did we see you and do all of this? He said, in as much as you have done for the least of these, you have done unto me. The way God is going to help the homeless in the pan pandemic is through us. Someone says, okay, another question. I, I have to go through several questions and let me just give you some of the highlights. Someone says, I am scared because I have heard that the Pope is behind this and the climate change debate to prepare the ground to enforce the mark of the B666, Sunday worship, etc., etc." Well, that is another subject, uh, uh, especially for a, a Seventh-day Adventist based on the Protestant uh, pioneers and their principle of biblical interpretation where they identify the, 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 the papal system as embodiment of the antichrist. We have argued that there will be the mark of the big six sixes and it has to do with worship. And we've talked about Sunday worship, etc. But the problem some of us are facing is, it appears anytime even the Pope drinks water or coughs, it becomes fulfillment of prophecy. And so for some of us, all that we are doing is looking, what is the Pope doing again? What is this? Those kinds of you know, sensationalism and speculation we should avoid. You shouldn't be afraid of the Pope or any other person. In fact, Martin Luther uh, answered it, and this is what he said. He said, quote, I am more afraid of my own heart than of the Pope and all his cardinals. I have within me the great Pope, and that is self. 
what we should be most afraid of is the great pope within us, self. Our self-independence, our pride, our arrogance. Anyway, uh, on this question about end time events, mark of the beast, 666s, uh, Sunday worship, et cetera, et cetera, I'll refer you to a website, you know, Amazing Facts website has some series on Bible prophecy that they will take you through Daniel and Revelation. It is written also has a website. Now is the time to go and study what the Bible says about all of these. Because not all uh, the people who th you, you think uh, of other denominations are necessarily, you know, not worshiping God the true way. Anyway, there's more I can say on this. As another question, is it now the time for country living? Should we leave the big cities? Well, it, it depends on why you are leaving the cities for the countryside, riding to the villages. Is it because of some survivalist conspiracy theory? You are so afraid because of a new world order and because people are tracking you down GP. So you are fleeing out of panic. I'm going to hide in a village somewhere. Or for some of us, we think that, okay, big cities are full of vile, immorality, crime. Therefore, I am fleeing. And yet you flee to the villages. You are still watching the same television, using your same phone to assess the same material. Th then what is the purpose of fleeing to the cities? We teach and encourage that in, in these last days, people should seriously consider going out of environments that are chaotic. Grow your own food. The countryside, the air is fresh. No one will bother you about all kinds of things. And so country living is encouraged, is preferable, it makes sense. I guess I'm protesting against a certain mindset that thinks, okay, I'm leaving the big cities, I'm going to the country, I am hiding. You are hiding and you are using a phone. Don't you know you'll be tracked down? Your safety is always in the Lord. There's more to this, but I think I've made my point. Oh, another question, I'm looking at my time because anyway, from point three of day six reflection, how is God's apparent delay in healing us from our afflictions and pain and suffering an evidence of God's love? Yes, yesterday's presentation, I showed from the Bible, John 11, five and six. The Bible says Jesus loved Mary, uh, Martha and Lazarus. And because he loved them, he delayed. And so his delay was evidence of love. And your question is, in what way is this evidence of love? We may not always uh, be able to tell why, but one day it will become clear. I, I know, for example, King Hezekiah in the Old Testament was sick. He prayed for healing. God healed him 15 extra years that he, he got. That was when he gave birth to his son Manasseh who became a genocidal killer, a human monster. Perhaps if God prolongs our health, what will happen to us will be worse. Or, and so God in his wisdom sometimes delays. He knows what is best for us. And in some cases, it is only later on that we will get to know that his delay in healing us was out of love. And also, even he's not healing us is also evidence of love. Perhaps I should take one more question and then quickly transition for my short devotional. Someone sends this question. If COVID-19 is a matter of hygiene as propagated, then most Africans and black people who live in densely populated areas such as slums and ghettos would be history. I am convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that there's more to this pandemic than we see. What is your observation in regards to this? Honestly, uh, I have also wondered about this whole situation. It, it is a fact. This whole crisis is about washing hands, 
human, you know, using sanitizers, which, I mean, then in Africa, we are in big trouble. I have wondered why COVID-19 is part of a group of viruses, some tw more than 22 viruses of the same family. But somehow this particular virus has been isolated and made the object of special focus. Why the hype? Who is benefiting from it? Though I am not fixated about the cause of this virus, you know, as I indicated in one of my presentations, uh, something is man-made in a laboratory, a kind of bioterrorism gone wrong, and it is being used for a purpose. Others also think is some people are behind it. I mean, all kinds of theories. I, I, I would not go there. We shouldn't go there. But my take on this is, regardless of how this came into being and the agenda behind it, as Christians, we must look at this thing from the general framework of Bible prophecy. Because if you study Bible prophecy, and I encourage you again, if you've never studied, especially the books of Daniel and Revelation, go to Amazing Facts website, go to It Is Written website. When you study what the Bible says, like Daniel 7, talking about you know the little horn, Revelation 13, 14, Mark of the Beast, and all of these things, it does talk about the fact that in the last days, civil liberties and religious liberties will be curtailed. People out of fear and panic will do all kinds of things and they will be worshiping the beast and his image and will receive his mark. Now, the, the current crisis has helped me to understand that this is very possible. Can you imagine in just about a month, look at how the whole world has literally been brought to a standstill, just about two, three months now. If the Bible says one day, the whole world is going to face a crisis like this. Now we know it is real. It can happen overnight. I mean, to the point that people today are looking for a spiritual leader. I can give you articles where people are crying for a spiritual global leader to lead us out of this mess. Even Muslims have suspended their Ramadan and their gathering because of this crisis. Mecca is empty. Churches seem to be coming together all these have prophetic ramifications. The world as we know it has changed. Religion is changing. It seems to me, if you are looking for my opinion, the stage is being prepared for what is coming to fulfill the final crisis of the hour. When economies, whole nations economy gripped in, in a mess overnight, educational system overnight. And in the name of health, people are willing to forgo their liberty. One day it will happen again. A political magazine has an article titled, Coronavirus will change the world permanently. And here is how. The March 19, 2020-ish online article of political magazine you know, has some 34 great thinkers of the world making their predictions of what is going to happen in the wake of this coronavirus. My take on all of this is this. You ask me, what is my take on this? Coronavirus is not the end of the world, but it has changed the world as we know it, and it is preparing the world for what is to come. We are living in the last days. Though we cannot tell and give any date, I can begin to understand how the biblical scenario can be easily fulfilled. As you all know, the Bible has pointed us to some signs of the times. You read Matthew 24, Luke 21, there will be religious crisis. 
international wars, global wars, fighting, etc., etc. Spiritual uh, 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 signs, many, many different signs. Time would not allow it. Uh, I, I wish I had the time. Otherwise, I could point to there will be persecution, natural disasters, international conflict, widespread apostasy, evangelism. There are all kinds of signs the Bible gives us. I believe that this is preparing the stage for what is yet to come. As I now transition, I'm looking at my time. As I transition to devotional thought, allow me to summarize for you what I believe to be going to happen. In fact, the Bible teaches us that in the last days, there is going to be a crisis. If you read the book of Revelation, Revelation 13, there is going to be a power, a beast power, who will give power to an image of the beast. They cannot buy, they cannot sell, unless they worship this beast and receive his mark, no 666, etc. In Revelation 14, 9 to 11, another power, God himself, is giving an instruction. If you worship the beast, his image, receive his mark, you also will be tormented. So two powers in the last days, all craving attention. This is the essence of the hour of trial that will come upon the whole world. I, I'm not uh, uh, going to go into who the identity of the beast and images and the cryptic numbers, 666, etc. Even though, you know, as Adventists, based on the Protestant principle of interpretation, we identify the end time role of the papacy in the United States. But that is not uh, the, the issue right now. The Bible tells us there is going to be a global conflict. And in this global conflict, the issue is going to be worship. You either worship the beast and his image, or you worship the one who created heaven and earth. And the test would also ultimately follow or or God's 10 commandments, because if it is going to be worshiped, then it is not so much the last six of the 10 commandments, but the first four commandments. Who you worship, commandment number one. Why you worship, commandment number two. How you worship, commandment number three. When you worship, commandment number four. This is where the Sabbath Sunday issue comes in. In the last days, the focus will be on the law of God and there will be no neutrality. You will either worship God and keep his law, or you worship a different power and keep their laws. And the decision we make is going to be costly. You cannot buy, you cannot sell, there will be economic consequences, and you may even be killed. But the Bible tells us, those who are faithful to God would gain the victory because God is going to point to them. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. So there will be people who would overcome in the last days. Another thing we need to consider in this end time discussions about Bible prophecy is the Bible is not so much concerned with beasts and images, numbers, et cetera. The concern of Bible prophecy is so that we can live holy lives. If you read 2 Peter chapter 2, from verse 10 to 13, having described how Jesus is coming, the day is at hand, it will come as a thief in the night. Then he says, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, the concern of God in all of these is that we should live holy life. That is what matters. And so for the next uh, few minutes that I have, allow me to offer you this short devotional thought that you can go home and reflect on it. It has to do with 
what will you do if you knew the world would end in a week, in a month or a year? Assuming this virus is ushering in the final apocalypse, how are you going to live your life? I'll give you some four or five points based on the Bible. Take your Bible, I invite you to take your Bible and turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 to 11. And the question we are going to answer is, what will you do? if you knew the world is coming to an end. You know, the Bible says the sons of Issachar had understanding of the times. They knew what they ought to do. That should be our focus. First Peter chapter four, verses seven to 11. It says, verse seven, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your praise. Let's just pause there. Verse 7 tells us two things we need to do. He says, be serious and watchful. That's point number one. I, I, I wish I had time. It, it appears many of us are not serious. We are joking, wasting time, doubling in mediocrity. He says, be serious and watchful. I have a book, Africa Must Think. The, the challenge of the hour, in these last days, the first thing we need to realize, we need to be serious. In fact, other versions translate it, be of sound judgment and sober spirit. The NIV says, be alert and of sober mind. In other words, have a clear and steady mind. Keep cool, think straight. Many of us are not thinking and people are doing the thinking for us. And, and, and honestly, you, my friends, Ghanaians, Africans living abroad, we are not thinking. Just like Africans on the continent, we are not thinking. Africa must think. We've got to be serious. Think straight. And in the context of end time, this is a warning against wild thinking, unbalanced life and view. And even in the context of Bible prophecy, people are not thinking. They panic and find themselves swayed by all kinds of things, worked up, setting dates, you know, charts, sensational things, speculations, conspiracy theories. Think. That is the first thing the Apostle Paul is saying. The opposite of being sober is frenzy or madness. We are going to face challenges in these last days. New interpretations. I mean, go to the internet, listen to the downloads from WhatsApp, all kinds of ridiculous nonsense that are being shipped on us. And because we are not thinking, we are doing all kinds of crazy things. Concoctions, we are drinking. Think. Some of us, are not being practical. We want to quit school. We want to quit work. We are not going to go to med school or whatever because Jesus is coming soon. So I, I, I have abandoned. Think. Live your life as if he's coming today. But plan as if he's coming tomorrow. Be sober-minded. Means you must be purposeful in your life. And don't be you know, drifting alone or impulsive in how you act. Let us be serious and watchful. What should you do when you knew the end is near? The first thing Peter tells us, First Peter chapter four, verse seven, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful. And then he tells us the second thing we should do in that same verse. Be serious 
and watchful in your prayers. The reason we are to be serious and watchful is in our prayers. In fact, other versions, Bible, render it even more explicitly. The New American Standard Bible says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. The New International Version says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer, or so that you may pray. Be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. One of the points Paul uh, Peter is saying in the last days, we must watch your prayer life. Why should you pray? Is it because you want to get something you want? Is that the reason we pray? No. The purpose of prayer is to have fellowship, intimacy, or relationship with God. As we would with someone we love. If you, you are in love with someone, you spend long hours in communication. You talk for long on the phone, text message, WhatsApp, FaceTime. God wants you to have an intimate relationship with him. So spend time, watch your prayer life. And this is a privilege. Because in addition to that intimacy we should develop, God is all powerful. Can you imagine what it means if you have fellowship, intimacy, a, a direct access to the most powerful person in your country, your prime minister, my president, or the greatest scientist? God is all of that and more. And he says you can come to him confidently. And so Peter is saying, the end of all things is at hand. Be serious and watchful. And number two, watch your prayer life. It is sad that many of us are not watching. By the way, Peter, the one who talked about watch and pray, he is reflecting on his own life as well. When Jesus took him to the garden of Gethsemane with two others, be with me, watch with me and pray. And he fell asleep. He wants to remind us that for the Christian life, there is no place for lazy, listless, routine praying. What is your prayer life? How is it like? We all talk about prayer, and yet it is the least practiced things among Christians. Re recently, Crossway Publishers did a major survey of 14,000 Americans and their prayer life. And they published this, you can Google uh, uh, this on November 2, 2020, under the title, Infographic, How Is Your Prayer Life? When you search it out, one of the things the study review is very surprising. It says one third of pastors indicated that they spend between five and 15 minutes a day in prayer one third of pastors. Only almost half of the pastors say they spend less than 20 minutes a day in prayer. This is what they admit doing. And those who've studied statistics, some of you have studied statistics, you know that surveys, in surveys, people exaggerate in their responses. They tell you what they think you want them to tell you. And so, if these pastors are saying the whole day they spend between five to 15 minutes a day in prayer, it means the truth is it is perhaps far less. And they are the pastors. Can you imagine what the average church member is? Because Jesus tells us a disciple is not above his teacher. So if pastors are not praying, church members are not praying. Peter says, in these last days, watch your prayer life. We spend a lot of time on the phone. 
a lot of time on WhatsApp, on Facebook, on internet. How much time do you pray? If you'll be honest, for many of us, our prayer is about two minutes, four minutes a day, maximum. Dear Lord, thank you for another day. Bless my mom, bless my dad. Thank you, help my studies, amen. Except during exams time, and then you pray perhaps one extra minute. Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Watch your prayer life. What do we mean? We should be serious about praying. One Christian writer has suggested that it means we must pray more. How much is more? We don't know. But certainly it's not five minutes or 20 minutes a day. We must cultivate the prayer without ceasing. We, we must come to a stage in our life that that is the first thing in our life on the day, the first priority in the morning. Spend time with him. And you don't have to stop in the morning, throughout the day, at work, at school. Pray, pray without ceasing. One scholar has suggested, Warren Wesby, he says, the test of our commitment to the doctrine of Christ's return is not our ability to draw charts like prophetic charts and discern times, but rather the test is our thinking and our prayer. If our thinking and praying are right, our living should be right. Warren Wesby, if our thinking and praying are right, our living should be right. So what should we do? If the end is near, from verse seven, we learn two things. We must be serious and watchful. We must think straight. We must watch our prayer life. That leads me to another thing we should do. And you find this in verse eight. I'll summarize it as you must fervently love one another. You see, we do not only focus in our relationship with God in prayer, the vertical component, we must also have a horizontal dimension, our relationship with people. Look at verse eight. Verse eight says, above all, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Notice, above all, above all, above all means, besides what he has already talked about, being serious, thinking straight, and then having your vertical relationship, above all, have fervent love for one another. Love is a key. Without this love for one another, we are nothing. First Corinthians chapter 13 says, now abides faith, hope, and love. The greatest is love. Verses one to three of first Corinthians 13. If I speak with tongues of men and angels and I have no love, I'm it's become a sounding brass and clanging cymbal. So don't tell me about how much speaking in tongues you can speak. And by the way, if there is time, I will show you from the Bible that this unintelligible ecstatic utterances put a question mark on it. I know Christian opinion is divided, but I can show you from the Bible that speaking in tongues is not what you should focus on. Paul says, without love, you are making noise. Verse two, he says, though I have the gift of prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge and have all the PhDs, the MDs, the DDs and the JDs, whatever it is, and all the prophetic charts. He says, if I have not love, and though I have all faith to move mountains, but not love, I am nothing. I am nothing, empty, zero. 
verse 3, 1 Corinthians 13 says, though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, humanitarian work, do all you can. And though I give my body to be burned, martyrdom, or Christian jihadism. <laughs> if I have no love, it profits me nothing. So Peter says, above all, have love for one another. When this world comes to an end and this life is over, so many things are going to be worthless and everything we've spent our lives on will become a total waste. But love is not. But take note of that text again, verse eight. I'm reading first, first Peter chapter four, verse eight. Notice what is emphasized in this love it is talking about. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Why? For love will cover a multitude of sins. What does it mean? The fervent love we are to display is related to, you know, uh, love covering a multitude of sins. We are not saying that if you love, you cover uh, other people's sins, then your sins will be forgiven. No, the only way our sins are going to be forgiven is through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean when Peter says, love will cover a multitude of sins? Here is where if you interpret the Bible correctly by comparing scripture to scripture, you get a whole meaning. In Proverbs chapter two, verse 12, he says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. What Peter is saying is, if you really love someone, your love will cause you to overlook so many of the person's wrongs and sins in his life. If you really love someone, your love will cause you to overlook so many wrongs and sins in their life. This is not a cover up for sin, but rather a forgiving disposition towards the person. Christian love is forgiving. We bend backwards to help the person. You, you think about it for, for a little while. We tend to judge people for things they do, especially things that annoy us. But when you really love somebody, you tend to overlook a lot of those little things. You see their flaws and their mistakes, but you bend backwards. Love covers a multitude of sin. But if you're really honest, you would know that if you don't like someone, you don't love someone, they do the same things and now you pounce on them. So the problem is not the actions of the individual, but it is you yourself. The reason we don't show grace to people is because deep down, we don't like them. Because if you really like someone, you find excuses to bend backwards and help them. So when Peter says, with Jesus coming soon, we must love one another because love covers a multitude of sins. He's basically saying, let us take one extra mile by being gracious and forgiving to one another. In fact, another text, Proverbs 17 verse nine also tells us, Proverbs 17, nine, he who covers a transgression seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates friend. Notice the one who covers transgression is contrasted with the one who repeats the matter to friends. In other words, Love covering a multitude of sin does not mean a cover up of sin. 
but it means we must not spread the sins and failures of others. Love does not gossip about the sins of others. It seeks to keep sin as private as possible. It avoids slander, blackmail. It seeks to work to redeem the person. Unfortunately, we try to make gossip sound like spiritual. Oh, I'm telling you this about this person, so we must pray more intelligently. No. Those awaiting the second coming of Christ, those living in the end times, are careful in how they handle the weaknesses and failures of others. And let me call attention one other thing from verse eight. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. I want to underscore the point, one another. The one another he is referring to is Christian believers, church members. Do you know that sometimes it is more difficult to relate to your fellow believers than outsiders, than even ungodly people. The church is the most difficult place to be. And Peter says, have love for one another, church members. That is where your test is going to be. Church members can be very mean. Get used to it. And transcend it by displaying a gracious attitude towards them. And by the way, the smallest church group is the home, our family members. Sometimes it is very hard to love them. When Peter speaks about covering the multitude of saints of church members, these are the Christian saints. It is a recognition that believers, Christian saints, are not necessarily faultless or sinless. Their sins have been forgiven, yes, but they are working day by day to overcome sin in their life. Sanctification, we call it. As you live in anticipation of the soon coming of Christ, love covers the sins of saints. Forgive, let go the hurt you are suffering from church members, from your family. Jesus said elsewhere in Matthew 24 that one of the signs of the times is the love of many will grow cold. Listen, if you are not careful, your faith is going to be destroyed in the church because of what other church members will do to you, what your elder will do to you, what your pastor will do to you what your Sabbath school teacher would do to you. Peter says, as you approach the second coming of Christ, be careful that you fervently love. Don't just love, fervently love. Let go, have a forgiving spirit. Let me summarize, I'll say two more and then uh, we are out. What should we do if the end is near? Peter says, we must be serious and watchful. Number two, we must watch our prayer life. Number three, we must fervently love one another. Number four, you find it in verse nine. Verse nine says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. From this, I get the fourth 
thing we must do in view of the end of all time. Be hospitable without grumbling. Hospitable literally means found of guests, not just tolerate them, be found of them, be a lover of hospitality. Some of us should engage in hospitality ministries. In fact, it can even be translated, have love for strangers. And we can expand this admonition to include people beyond the borders of our Christian commonwealth, our homes, our churches, our schools should be places where we display generosity. I'm not talking about you giving something to someone grudgingly. He says, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. Somebody requests you a favor, do so cheerfully, graciously. Your food, your clothing, your money. This is what the early church was. Everyone shared what they had. This is what Dorcas did. This is what Abraham did, entertaining strangers graciously. Not this Ananias Sapphira spirit in the church and within our homes. You know someone is in need and you are not willing to reach out. Look at all the shoes and the clothes in your closet. When are you going to use it? Thank God coronavirus has shown you you are not going to wear this anywhere. Share. Share whatever you have. Share your knowledge and your skills. Some of us are doing well in school. We don't want to share our knowledge because we don't want another person to get the same A grade like me. No, no, no. If God has blessed you, you are good at math, you are good at chemistry, whatever, music, whatever, share. It is more blessed to share, to give than to receive. I have one more to go. What should you do if the end is near? From verses seven and eight and nine, we learn we must be serious and watchful. We must watch our prayer life. We must be fervent, we must fervently love one another we must be hospitable without grumbling. And the last point I would make, we must employ our gifts in serving. Every Christian is called to serve. You read this in verses 10 and 11. It says, verse 10 and 11, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I wish there was time. But this much I would say. Each one of us has been given a gift, a spiritual gift. The moment you give your life to the Lordship of Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. He endows you with at least one spiritual gift. He says, as each one has received. That means no one is excluded. Not you or any. So the days are over when you can just sit in the church as a potted plant doing nothing. Young people have been endowed with spiritual gifts. They must use it to the glory of God. 
to serve. To serve. You are not a spectator. Notice again, Peter says, employ the gift. Verse 10, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. God has been so gracious to you. Use your gift, employ it. If you don't use your gifts, you are going to lose it. Use it, use it. And look at the motivation, why you must use your gift for service. The motivation, is to glorify God. We serve to God's glory. Notice how he says it in verse 11. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do so. It is with the ability which God supplies that in all things, that is, so that in all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The glory belongs to God, not you. Not your ability. Away with this mindless notion that I am a spiritual guru with this uh, abandoned gift. Forget it. we must serve to God's glory. Which is what Paul would say somewhere else. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. I think I have ended. Today is the last day of our series in these times. Understanding the meaning of now in the light of coronavirus and Bible prophecy. It is not just enough to understand the, the times in which we live, like the men of Issachar. They understood the times and they knew what Israel ought to do. What should we do in these times? Peter says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and watchful. Watch your prayer life. Fervently love one another. Be hospitable without grumbling. Employ your gifts to serve, to minister to others. I want to challenge you young people. Coronavirus could be a blessing in disguise. Now is the time. There is a crisis coming. As I said on the opening night, there is a trial which is coming upon the whole world. But God, will keep you. He knows your frame. That was day two. He's pleading for you. That was day three. He will provide for you in this lockdown situation. Day four, he has a plan for your life. It is not in any human hands, your teachers, whatever they will do to your grace. No, no. God has a plan for your life. He will raise you up, even if you fall sick and die. And today, he will come for you and reward you. Jesus says, Revelation 22, 12, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according as the works would be. Now is the time. Now 
is the time. We are going to pray. And we are going to listen to our theme song one last time. All that I need is you. As we play that song for the last time, reflect on it in the light of the things we have studied. Let that be your prayer that early in the morning to late at night. Listen to that song. I only hope my hope is you, bow our heads and pray thanking the Lord for the privilege accorded us to have him as our only hope. You know, if the messages have spoken to you in some way, because I am speaking first and foremost to myself. And if it has spoken to you, it's because you are like me. Struggling but knowing that my only hope is the Lord. He knows our frame and he has promised to keep us. Thank him for this. Thank him for the fact that he has been pleading for you. He has given you this year also, 2020. And though there are so many uncertainties, God has pledged to provide. He has the plan for your life. Corona or not, God's plan will be accomplished if you submit to him. And whether you succumb to this sickness or death, he will raise you up. And he's coming soon. So use this time even in your studies when the door opens and we have online classes, determine that your studies will be for one purpose only, to serve. Your professional gifts, to serve. Ask the Lord to help you, above all, to develop the kind of faith that will survive this crisis. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you have created by ordinary young people in the UK. No one forced them to do this, but they found a need just coming together to pray, to reflect on your word. Thank you for these young people and their lives. 
You've heard about their fears, their needs. Lord, like us, they are also so frail and weak. But you have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. Let these gifts and attributes be theirs. Let it create in them an outlook on life, a passion for excellence, academic excellence, spiritual excellence, a daring spirit to share their lives. Lord, we need you. We need you. Help us to watch our prayer life from early in the morning till late at night. And as we pray for ourselves, we pray for our family, our parents, our brothers and sisters, our church members, because we are all in this together. Father, the program has ended this week, but we know you have greater plans for our lives. Open our eyes to see possibilities. But more than all these, help us to develop a trust, a faith in you, rock solid faith that would defy everything, hardship, persecution, failure, discouragement, whatever it is. Lord, bless each one of us. When we are weak, strengthen us. When we are down, lift us up. When we are sorrowful, comfort us. And Lord, let your goodness, your mercy, follow us all the days of our lives until by your grace, we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Roberto, I would hand back to you and I want to say thank you again so much for all that you have done for the young people. I noticed that there were a few glitches here and there, sometimes frustration. That is okay. That is how we grow and learn. Sure. Learn this, rise up from this experience to emerge as men and women of excellence, the people Africa needs, the black world needs, and the whole world needs. What your church needs and what the Lord needs. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Continue the good work and i pray that this platform you have created will be the beginning of the proliferation of gifts talents abilities to advance the cause of god in this generation may you be richly blessed i'll give you amen. the last word amen thank you very much god bless you um please i'd like everyone to stay and we have mary who would like to share a few words with Dr. Pippin. Mary. For this week and the participants that have been joining on a daily basis, I would like to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to Dr. Pippin for taking the time and the effort to present words of encouragement, words of advice, and words from exactly from the Bible, from Jesus Christ himself to encourage us. I am confident to say that we have all been inspired and that we've learned something new or something that we will take on into the week and into um, after lockdown and throughout our whole lives. I would also like to acknowledge Roberto for successfully leading the program and introducing all the participants and those who have been involved. I'd like to thank those who have worked behind the scenes to set up the Zoom calls, as well as supporting out, you know, sorting out the technical difficulties that have been going on. Um, I'd like to thank the singers who have sung amazingly throughout the week, um, given us word of encouragement through their ministries. I would like to thank those who have participated in their prayer sessions, um, all participants and anyone else that I've missed out. Um, I'm so sorry, but just thank you so much for your involvement if, um, in this program. Once again, um, everybody, I'd like to state that we are so grateful to the speaker. Thank you so much. Honestly, this week has been a blessing for many of us. 
and as we heard from the um the testimonies it's been great and we've learned something and it's been such a um, pleasure so may god continue to protect us to guide us and comfort us throughout this year and the years to come according to his will amen 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 thank you very much again and thank you all it wouldn't have been possible if you were not here and i am sure this will definitely change your life or it has impacted your life in a way or the other um as i said wednesday we will be having From early in the morning till late at night.